morning, everyone. Well, happy Sabbath to you all. We uh, had a nice introduction to it last night, you know, as we continued our seminar on the origin, transmission, and preservation of the Word of God. Um, how many of you appreciated uh, what Ted brought to us last night? Good, thank you. It's my privilege to have my brother Ted with me today and his wife Luella from uh, Fairfield, Montana. And uh, Ted has been doing some study on the issue of the transmission of the text for quite a number of years. If you've gotten the printed materials, you'll see embedded somewhere in that material on a number of occasions, you'll see an unpublished manuscript and that's um, a project that he's been working on for some time and uh, it's it's coming closer to we hope getting in print anyway uh, because it touched on so many of the issues that I felt were uh, important for the presentation of our subject as we think about the uh, heritage of the English Bible and of course this is the 400th year anniversary of the King James Bible I thought it was appropriate that Ted come and share some of the uh, results of his research. A lot of confusion, uh, not just in the Christian world in general, but in Adventism particularly when it comes to the transmission of the text. And uh, so he kind of laid the foundation for some things last night that are we're going to just jump right into it today. Uh, and. Uh, the title here, Rome's End Run, it's kind of, I'll let Ted flesh that out a little bit. Um, Rome's End Run around what? You know, uh, we'll be looking at that probably on two levels at least. And uh, so Ted, thanks for coming and for presenting the subject last night and uh, what we don't finish this morning in the little less than an hour that we have here, we'll pick up right at seven o'clock this evening. So. Uh, without further ado. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, Rome's end run. Around what? Well, it is Rome's end run around Protestantism through their work in the transmission of the text. And it's put in chart form, Rome's end run, right up there on the board. So it's right before you there that the modern, most of the modern versions that exist today come from the UBS text. We looked at some of this last night, and um, we looked at the documentation that shows, indeed, that most of the modern versions are from the UBS text. The UBS text, according to those that were involved in the project, came and was based upon the text of Westcott and Hort, which in turn was based upon the corrupted Vaticanus and Sinaiticus text. Now, I'll tell you straight out, so you're all orientated in your thinking, that the end run here is that the Vaticanus text is the text that the official text of Roman Catholicism is based on according to the Council of Trent, and that is the Latin Vulgate. Now, as we explained last night, the Latin Vulgate came from the Old Latin, which predated the Latin Vulgate by a couple of hundred years. But the Latin Vulgate was also derived from the Vaticanus Manuscript. And as Jerome sat to do his work on that, he, he moved, uh, Jerome was basically a Gnostic. He lived the ascetic life outside of Antioch. And in 382, about 30 to 40 years after the Vaticanus manuscript had been produced by Eusebius, Jerome went to Rome at the behest of uh, Pope Damasus to produce an official text for the Church of Rome, because as we explained last night, Rome was in the process of being divided east and west. And the Pope thought it was important to have a united text for a, um, 
a, to have a united church. And so Jerome's Latin Vulgate was based upon the old Latin, but as we quoted some various sources, one of them was the spirit of prophecy, the Latin Vulgate contained many errors. And many of those errors no doubt came from the Vaticanus text. Well, of course, today we have two Greek texts that are used by the modern critics. We have the Greek text of the United Bible Societies, and we have the Greek text of Nestle and Allen. Now, where we stand today, both those critical texts are virtually one and the same text. They're virtually identical texts. We looked at three names last night, and not to focus on the person individually, but these three names represent three approaches to the biblical text. One name was Carlo Martini. He was a Roman Catholic cardinal, and he was a Jesuit. And I made a point of stressing what the spirit of prophecy says in the great controversy on page 235, that wherever the Jesuits went, there followed a revival of popery. And not only that, the Jesuits were raised up to um, not only counter the Protestant Reformation, but to destroy Protestantism. So we today would do well to ask ourselves the question, what are we doing working with the Jesuit in the business of the biblical text, and where has it taken us? Another name was Bruce Metzger, a form critic. Now, we say a form critic here. This is by his own admission. Metzger had written many books, and one of them was the New Testament text, it's transmission, corruption, and restoration. Now, you can tell by that subtitle that the very subtitle breathes higher criticism. <laughs> and um, form criticism is a, one of the most popular schools of higher criticism. We'll have more to say about that sh very shortly. That form criticism and oral tradition go hand in hand. The form critics ask themselves, you see, a form critic believes that the Bible was handed down in, by oral tradition. One person would tell one and one another and one another still. And so it was handed down from individual to individual, from generation to generation. Finally, it was written down. The form critic, who is a higher critic, asks themselves, what happened to the text during that period of time before it was written down, you see. Um, those that have faith in the promises of God to preserve his word, don't worry about things like that because they have faith in the promises of God that he will preserve his word. We'll be getting more into that in just a moment. But again, inspiration says speaking of higher criticism in the book Upward Look, page 35, in this way, all nations are induced to drink the wine of the fornication of Babylon. Sounds like to me that higher criticism is going to be used in a very important way to bring Protestantism back to Rome, doesn't it? According to that text, I understand that the wine of Babylon is not something that originated with Adventism. Eugene Nita, we talked about Nita, who was the father of dynamic equivalence. The idea of dynamic equivalence is that the translator gets into the business of interpreting and defining the terms before he translates them. And uh, in our Sunday evening session, we're going to look at the absolute devastating effects that that has had upon the foundational and pillar doctrines of our faith. It is just appalling what has happened there. And notice again, the Romish, the Rome word trend of this principle in operation, that the man sets himself up as the interpreter of God's word. Whereas the Protestant principle is that the Bible is its own interpreter. 
And so the person that comes to a version of the Bible that is produced under higher critical methodologies is going to be reading a scripture that has already been interpreted for him. We don't want that. God wants us each individually under the unction of the Holy Spirit to go to his word and by comparing scripture with scripture to interpret the word. You see, the word of God, the true, pure word of God is infallible. Higher critics do not believe that, but we do. We believe that the word, the true, pure word of God is infallible, so only that which is infallible can interpret that which is infallible. And so that is why the Bible is a self-interpretive unit. Now, Metzger says, when he was asked, what, did you, what was your process that you used when you produced the UBS text? And this was his answer. We took as our base at the beginning the text of Westcott and Hort and introduced changes as seemed necessary on the basis of manuscript evidence. So they took Westcott and Hort's text, which was uh, uh, based upon the Vaticanus, and they used that as their base, but then they also used the Vaticanus in addition to the Sinaiticus manuscript to produce the UBS text, which, again, all the modern versions, most of the modern versions are based upon. Now, this bit of documentation came from the book, The Revision Revised by a 19th Century Writer by the name of John Bergen. Um, if you get a chance, look up John Bergen. Uh, he was a who's who in terms of uh, textual analysis in the 19th century. No one was John Bergen's equal. He had collated the five major uncials, and he was intimately familiar with the received text that, ki that the King James Version is based upon. And of all the people that existed at that time, he was eminently qualified to see the quality and the nature of those manuscripts. The Council of Trent reaffirmed the Latin Vulgate as the official Catholic version of the Bible. Um, but notice this. The Greek text followed in this translation, and this is from the preface of the New American Bible, which is one of the more recent uh, English versions of the Catholic Bible. And what do they say? The Greek text followed in this translation is that of the third edition of the Greek New Testament edited by Kurt Allen, Matthew Black, Carlo Martini, Bruce Metzger, and Alan Whitgren, and published by the United Bible Societies in 1975. Well, now that's interesting. I thought that all versions were to be um, corrected and, and comport to the Latin Vulgate, the official Bible of Roman Catholicism. But here, by Rome's own admission, they're in the preface to their own Bible. They're saying, no, not the Latin Vulgate, the UBS. So we're, we're, we're getting into a little bit of the anatomy of the end run that has been made on Protestantism here. And this is not a tempest in a teapot. Uh, we're just looking at a little uh, bit of the picture here this morning, but we're setting the basis for what we're ultimately going to be talking about in uh, the future sessions here. So this is just vitally important, I believe, that Protestants understand this, and especially Seventh-day Adventists. And not only was the English, one of the recent English versions of the Catholic Bible, the New American Bible, um, comporting to the UBS text, even the New Latin Vulgate is corrected according to the UBS text. Um, and that was authorized by Pope Paul VI in 1965. Now, just kind of keep track of these dates here as we move along, because we'll find that there's a progression of events uh, where things really begin to happen rather rapidly. Um, 
And then this um, text was published by the German Bible Society in 1979, um, which was a member of the United Bible Societies. And uh, again, the corrected Latin text conforms to the UBS text. Um, I don't know how many of you recognize these <laughs> modern versions of the Bible, but they're based upon the same manuscripts that the New Latin Vulgate and the New English Bible of the Catholic Church is based upon. The Revised Standard Version, the New Revised Standard Version, the New American Standard Version, the Revised English Bible, the Good News Bible, and the official title of the Good News Bible is, of course, today's English version, which was produced by uh, Dr. Robert Bratcher, who followed very closely the dynamic equivalence of Eugene Nita, which was published by the American Bible Societies, which is a member of the United Bible Societies, which is rather interesting. And we'll be getting more into this, too, because our church heavily supports the American Bible Society, which produced the, uh, today's English version, which totally decimates in the very text of the Scriptures. We're not talking about marginal comments here. We're talking about changing the very text of the Scripture itself that totally obliterates the foundational doctrine of our faith. Now, as I said before, this last night, folks, this is serious business. Uh, this is no time for uh, Protestants to be playing around, and it's no time for uh, Seventh-day Adventists to be playing games. We can sit here and play the part of soft um, Protestantism, sleepy, but there is a warfare afoot here, folks, that is alarming. And it is time for God's people to come straight awake and realize that this is going for the jugular of Adventism. Make no mistake about this. And each one of us have to come under a personal conviction of this and not allow the status quo that swirls around us to affect our level of awareness of what is taking place here. So we'll be looking at some of these things, how it specifically, specifically affects... Um, just the key doctrines of Adventism, especially our sanctuary doctrine, which we are told and is reconfirmed several times is the foundation of our faith. Well, uh, other um, modern versions here, the New American Bible, well, that's the Catholic Bible we were talking about, the New International Version, and there's a common thread here between all of these, and that is, of course, that they're ultimately all based upon the Latin Vulgate and the Vaticanus. And uh, we have a question that is posed here. Is it any surprise then that the new versions reflect a Romish flavor? I'm not going into detail on this, but I do do that in my book, which shows where there are doctrinal changes, and that is one of the many denials. Well, there is no doctrinal changes. Let me disabuse you of that notion. There are doctrinal changes, and there are crucial doctrinal changes. And, and many of those doctrinal changes are Romish in flavor. Not all of them, but many of them are. Well, this is the reason why, is because of the Romish background that is involved here. Now, we want to look just briefly at the pre-UBS. Any time, we've been warned against confederations of various kinds and inspiration, you know. And as soon as we see the Bible societies, which had existed for many years, as soon as they became confederated under the umbrella of the United Bible Societies, we see some changes really begin to take place. And, um, of course, the Seventh-day Adventists can look at these confederations and instantly, instinctively recognize this is dangerous. But history now proves out, well, it was dangerous, and it is dangerous. Um, 
But before the UBS, there were no formal working agreements between Protestants and Catholics for Bible translation. Now, mind you, there were, with the earliest days of the Bible societies, and the Bible societies were um, entities of uh, a Protestant nature, there were individual Catholics that were involved in, this, in these works. But we're talking about official church involvement here. Post-UBS, the Jesuit Carlo Martini is involved in producing the UBS Greek text. Remember, the Bible societies were originally a Protestant initiative, but then something changed. What happened? And this is where Rome's end run is, the appearance of making concessions in cooperation with a Bible society publication. There was the appearance of a diminished Latin Vulgate, the Roman participation in Greek text publication based on so-called, quotes, more reliable and more ancient authorities. You'll read these expressions in the modern versions repeatedly, won't you? Well, these more reliable and ancient authorities, they often will not tell you what they are, but they're referring to the Catholic codices, the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus manuscripts. And you know that when you read the books of the men that were involved in these productions. You might not necessarily uh, read it in the prefaces of these versions, nor will you read it in the margins, but you will read it in their books when you read their books. Protestant uh, growing acceptance of the new versions and the denigration of the King James Version. Now there was one individual within Adventism, and as I said last night, this man was, is recognized, even today he is quoted, by people outside of Adventism writing and publishing upon the business of the versions of the Bible and quoting Benjamin G. Wilkinson. And he's referred to as a man of first rank, a scholar of first rank. Um, and his research took him to the libraries of the earth around the world. So... Um, Wilkinson knew what he was talking about, an early Adventist there, and um, reacting to Wilkinson's book, Our Authorized Bible Vindicated, and that book is right on the table over here, sitting right on the left-hand corner over there, and I recommend that every Seventh-day Adventist read that book. It's dated, but when you read it, you'll think, wow, it just fits today uh, what's going on. Um, anyway, reacting to Wilkinson's Our Authorized Bible Vindicated, some within Adventism are telling people the King James Version is based upon the Latin Vul Vulgate and quotes that the Bible of the Walden Seas was the Vulgate itself. Well, that, that quote is right from the world of Adventism. Yeah, well, if you were here last evening you know that that just simply is not the case at all. Well, we have in 1964 the Drybergen Conference where there was this formal collaboration. This is just a few years after the Vatican II Conference, which was called an ecumenical conference, by the way, which was also, like the Council of Trent, a Jesuit-controlled conference. And the purpose of the Drybergen Conference was unabashedly uh, the purpose of it was to create a common text of the Bible. Well, it was in that same year in 1964 that Eugene Nita, who was a delegate to the founding conference of UBS in 1946, introduced the theory of dynamic equivalence. And again, we know the story on that. 1965, Pope Paul VI authorized a corrected edition of the Latin Vulgate that conformed to the third edition of the UBS. And that same year, Cardinal B, who was, incidentally, like Martini, Cardinal Martini, was a Jesuit. Some of those few exceptions there. Cardinal B played a crucial role at Vatican II, and he also attended the World Council of Churches session, which was just shortly, just a few years before the Vatican II Council was, was not allowed for Catholics to attend World Council of Churches sessions. 
The Catholic Encyclopedia says the attitude of the church toward the Bible societies is one of unmistakable opposition, believing herself to be the divinely appointed custodian and interpreter of the Holy Writ. She cannot, without turning traitor to herself, approve the distribution of Scripture without note or comment. And I brought this book here this morning just to illustrate. Now, this is an official book of Roman Catholicism that tells you what the index is, the index of uh, prohibited books. And this book right here on page 28 mentions the King James Version of the Bible as being a Bible that is prohibited by Roman Catholicism. Isn't that interesting? All the others are in the same cast except the King James Version of the Bible is prohibited. Now, supposedly, they have uh, gotten rid of the index in the um, Vatican II session. That, that was set aside. But we know the attitude is still there because inspiration tells us that Rome never changes. Um, it says here in Great Controversy, the opposition of the Bible by the Roman Catholic Church to the Bible by the Roman Catholic Church has continued through the centuries and was increased particularly at the time of the founding of the Bible societies. On December 8, 1866, Pope Pius IX in his encyclical Quanta Cura issued a syllabus of 80 errors under 10 different headings. Under heading 4, we find listed socialism, communism, clandestine societies, Bible societies, Pests of this sort must be destroyed by all possible means. Well, does that give you an inkling of its attitude there? Um, warning the faithful, the Vatican reiterated and under, underscored its opposition to joint meetings with other faiths when it warned all Catholics not to participate in the Special Assembly of the World Council of Churches in August 1948. Well, that's getting to be fairly recent history, isn't it? That's getting pretty close. Um, Protestantism is just as wrong now as it was in 1517, and it is the duty incumbent on us as Catholics to spread the word and make America Catholic. Father Isaac, Isaac Hecker founded the Paulist Fathers for the express purpose of making America Catholic. They are still doing a fine job at it. It is the goal of every bishop, priest, and religious order in the country. No Catholic can settle with good conscience for a policy of appeasement or even mere coexistence with a non-Catholic community. And look at the date on that. That's 1960. That's a mere two years before Vatican II, isn't it? The official position of the Vatican remained negative until Vatican II. Roman Catholics were were forbidden to attend the first two World Council Assemblies of the World Council of Churches in 1948 and 1954, and that's by our own Bert B. Beach co-authoring the book So Much in Common with Lucas Vischer of the World Council of Churches. The Roman Church now presents a fair front to the world, covering with apologies her record of hor horrible cruelties. She has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is unchanged. Every principle of the papacy that existed in past ages exists today. That's the Great Controversy, 571. Um, then it goes on to say, look at the underlying portion there. There has been a change, but the change is not in the papacy. Catholicism indeed resembles much of the Protestantism that now exists because what? Because Protestantism has so greatly degenerated since the days of the Reformation. Gives us something to think about in all this biblical version business and how it's comporting to Rome's manuscripts. Rome never changes. Her principles have not altered in the least. She has not lessened the breach between herself and Protestants. They have done all the advancing. But what does this argue for Protestantism of this day? It is the rejection of the Bible truth with which makes men approach to infidelity. It is a backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. Rome has not moved away from the Latin Vulgate. In working with the UBS, thus Rome has not changed its position. So this is something we've got to let sink down to the cranial 
localities of our brain. That Rome hasn't changed here. Somebody else has changed. It has simply collaborated with the UBS in getting it to use a Greek text of its preference and one that continues to reflect the Latin Vulgate and corrupted sources with little alarm to the Protestants. Protestants, on the other hand, have naively embraced the Latin Vulgate of Rome because both the Latin Vulgate and the Greek text of the West Cotton Hort, upon which the modern versions are based, use the same manuscript, the Vaticanus. Something we need to think about. And this, this is from Wilkinson's book, this quote by Cardinal Wiseman, quote, when we, no, this is a cardinal that's saying this. When we consider the scorn cast by the reformers upon the Vulgate and their recurrence, in consequence to the Greek as the only accurate standard, we cannot but rejoice at the silent triumph which truth has at length gained over clamorous error. For in fact, the principal writers who have avenged the Vulgate and obtained for it its critical preeminence are Protestants. And folks, that happened in the Oxford movement and in the production, the consequent production, of the English Revised Version of the Bible. And that English Revised Version of the Bible, based upon the Westcott and Hort Greek text, again, is the same text that the modern versions are based upon. And notice the testimony of this cardinal in regard to how it was Protestants that did it. This is exactly what inspiration says is happening. Protestants are doing all the advancing. And here, the cardinal's saying the same thing. So the summary of the end run, Rome anathematizes Bible translations. And they do that, by the way, in this book. What is the index? They anathematize them. Rome rejects worship with Protestants. Rome collaborates with Bible translation. Rome joins and advances ecumenism. Rome boasts of silent triumph of getting Protestants to avenge the Latin Vulgate by defending an inferior Greek text for the new versions. Rome thus keeps the distortion of Scripture. See again? So Rome hasn't changed a thing. Not a thing. Rome thus maintains biblical basis for the distortion of the Bible doctrine. And we see here that in this end run that... Uh, Rome has made upon Protestantism. Rome has not changed its position one little iota. They have, been made, they have made themselves look like that. They have capitulated on using the Latin Vulgate as their primary official text by embracing the Vaticanus that the modern versions are based on when in fact the Latin Vulgate was based upon the Vaticanus and the Old Latin in the first place. So we can see then how that Rome hasn't given up anything whatever. Now we have here um, the business of oral tradition. This is the merger, if you please, a classical example of how you have form criticism. Because form criticism and oral tradition go hand in hand. And one of the principles that came out of the, that was reconfirmed in the Council of Trent was tradition. And here we have oral tradition, the bringing the marriage together of tradition and form criticism in regards to the Word of God. Now the... Um, Bruce Metzger, whom the Biblical Research Institute quotes frequently, refers to the Greek underlying the New Testament of the King James Version as the time-honored but corrupt textus receptus. You see, and the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus are referred to as, quotes, the neutral text. And what they mean by that, why the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus are so close to the original autographs, according to the West Co Hort uh, theory that it's as good as that which came from the hand of the original author. 
That's why they call it the neutral text. Now, Metzger said the received text, we talked about the received text last night. It's um, the whole history there of the received text. But uh, Metzger says it was corrupted. Again, I said at the beginning, Metzger in his book talked about the transmission, corruption, and restoration of the text. He's referring to the received text that was transmitted, corrupted, and then corrected according to the Vaticanus manuscripts. That's what he's talking about. But God says his word is incorruptible. Man says God's word is corrupted. Who do you believe, folks? Are you going to believe God in his word where he says that his word is incorruptible? That's what the scripture says. Man says it's corrupted. I'll take God's word. We have two major streams of text here. We touched on this last night. The left-hand uh, stream of text, the Byzantine, the Old Latin, which was very early on, within the first century, was derived from the uh, Byzantine text. That Old Latin was the Latin at the Italic, which the Waldenses used. You see the Waldenses there. Um, the Italic was a a Waldensian dialect. And the Waldenses derived their text right straight from the Greek Vulgate. And we mentioned last night that when the King James Version translators sat to do their work, they had no less than six Waldensian Bibles before them. Why? Because the Reformers recognized instantly when they saw a Waldensian Bible they saw textual purity. And um, that was reflected in their usage of it in the 1611 uh, version. On the right-hand side, you see another lineage. Now, in most charts that you see today, uh, for example, the one that was put out by the American Bible Society, they take these two separate lineages and they fuse them and make them look like a single lineage of manuscripts. But this is not so. There were two separate lineages of manuscripts, starting with Origen's Hexapla. And Eusebius was such a devoted disciple of Origen that he was called by his contemporary, contemporaries uh, the second Origen. Origen and Eusebius, and, uh, all the people that were involved behind the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus manuscripts, they were very Gnostic in their orientation. So small wonder then that when we look at a lot of the modern versions today that are based upon the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus manuscripts, you see them actually expunge certain scriptures that speak to the deity of Christ. Again, we talked about that last night. 1 John 5, 7, uh, 1 Timothy 3, 16, etc. So there's reasons for that. There's actual history here of how this came to be and how it's reflected out in the modern versions today. So we're going to pick this up again this evening, and we're going to be moving in more into uh, textual uh, analysis of how this dramatically affects Adventist doctrine, and we're going to see how, as the subtitle of my book uh, is explaining, the, the tremendous spirit of prophecy involvement in how the spirit of prophecy um, agrees with the King James Version while the modern versions agree with each other against both the King James Version and the spirit of prophecy. So we'll be looking at some of those things in our subsequent uh, discussions here. Thank you. Okay, where's our moderator for this morning? Bob? You're on. Thank you.